I want you to take some time now to think about the gospel. We should uh, be thinking every day about the gospel for a whole lot of different reasons. For one thing, it's the gospel that transforms us. Paul says it's the power of God for salvation. This isn't just a message. This is a message that God uses to do something. He saves sinners from the penalty of sin, but not only does he save them from the penalty of sin through the gospel, he transforms them, he changes them. He changes not just them, he changes us as we think about the gospel and preach the gospel to ourselves. We need to think about the gospel because so often we don't think about the gospel. We have to deliberately focus on this message because there are so many messages out there, so many false gospels really that people are constantly telling us and sharing us that get into our minds and we begin meditating on these things that are not even true. And so often, even though we're believers, we don't spend time thinking about the gospel. We need to think about the gospel because it's the power of God for salvation, because uh, so often we don't, and because it's just worth thinking about the gospel. There is no message like the gospel. God is the author of this message. Uh, men have come up with lots of ideas and plans, but this message, it's not surprising that it is so deep and profound because God is the one who actually came up with the gospel. And what a privilege we have to study it. This message was hidden for a long time. If you think about how the gospel works, it's uh, there's something called progressive revelation in the Bible. And slowly but surely, as we read the Bible, God is revealing more and more about how he's going about saving men. And it's in the gospel that we get the clearest revelation of how God is going to accomplish this great salvation. What a privilege. Angels and prophets, the Bible tell us, tells us long to actually they long to be able to think about the gospel. And even now, as we look around us, if you're a believer, you are one of the few people in the world that can really appreciate the gospel. The unbeliever, first of all, many unbelievers don't even know the gospel, the facts of the gospel, but even those who do know the facts of the gospel, they can't appreciate it. They're like blind men looking at the Mona Lisa. They, they can't see the painting. They can't see the beauty. But God has not only given you this message, if you're a Christian, you're one of the select few in this on this planet that have the spirit of God who will enable them to actually see the beauty in the gospel. So we need to and we should want to think hard about the gospel and we've been trying to do that recently just by starting with what is the gospel and we've said first of all the gospel is news and it's news ultimately about God and his glory. And one reason God gets the glory in the gospel is because God is the hero of the gospel. That's what I want you to hear today. God is the hero of the gospel. I once heard someone say that if you wanted to summarize the gospel in three words, you could summarize it, God saves sinners. And each of those words is important for understanding the gospel, but what I want you to think about today is just the first word, God. God saves sinners, and that's so important. If the gospel is news, you might say, God is the headline story. You are not the headline story. If the gospel is a news report and you were driving down the street and you saw the sign there, your name would not be on it. The headline news of the gospel, the great announcement of the gospel, for, for, focuses first on God, who he is, and what he's done. And when we open up our Bibles, we see that everywhere. For example, listen to Paul's summary of the gospel in Colossians chapter 1. And as we read, I just want you to notice who's the subject of each verb. In other words, when we read these verses, the one thing I want you to notice is who is the one doing all the acting? Who is the one accomplishing all these things in these verses as Paul talks about the gospel? We'll begin in Colossians 1.12. Paul says that he's praying that these people would give thanks to the Father who's qualified you to share in the inheritance 
of the saints in the light. So somebody has been qualified to be able to participate in this great inheritance. And the question that I'm asking as you think about this verse, who did the qualifying? Who's the one who did the qualifying? Was it me? Was it you? Did I qualify myself to share in the inheritance of the saints in the light? Is that what the passage says? No, no way. The passage says the Father qualified us. How about verse 13? He has delivered us from the domain of darkness and transferred us to the kingdom of his beloved son. So something dramatic has taken place in your life as a Christian. You've gone from this place where you were part of the domain of darkness and you've been taken up, you've been transferred to another place, the kingdom of God's beloved son. And my question for you is, how did that happen? Who did the, the delivering? Who did the transferring as you look at that passage? Is it me? Did I get the idea of the kingdom? Did I get the idea that the kingdom of God's son would be much better and I kind of worked hard and somehow I freed myself, I released myself from captivity and I dove out and I ran over there to the kingdom of God's beloved son? No, that's not what the passage says. Listen to verse 13. He, God the Father, it's the same person. He has delivered us. He has transferred us. Down in verse 19, Paul says, for him, in him, Jesus, all the fullness of God was pleased to dwell. This verse is talking about Jesus. In him, it's explaining why he has the first place in the universe. For, for in Jesus, all the fullness of God was pleased to dwell. I think a better translation of that verse is actually, for it was the Father's good pleasure for all the fullness to dwell in him. You look at God the Son becoming man. Why? It was the Father's delight. Why did all the fullness of deity dwell in Jesus? Paul says it was God the Father's sovereign plan, the incarnation, God the Son becoming man, the fullness of God, everything that God is, dwelling in Jesus, him having first place in everything, was the directest result of a decision made by God the Father. It wasn't a group of people petitioning God, saying, God, oh God, could you please send God the Son? In fact, we were running the opposite way. The gospel tells us that it all begins with a decision God the Father made. Verse 20, you can see it. And through him to reconcile to himself all things. Through Jesus. Here somebody is doing something through Jesus. Who does the reconciling? Who does the making peace? Through Jesus. Was it us? Were we the ones who found a way to manipulate God into having peace? We uh, came up with these terms and maybe God would sign the contract? No. It was God the Father providing peace through Jesus Christ. God the Father is the source of the gospel. He is the cause of the gospel. He is the reason for the gospel. He is the fountain from which the gospel flows. And this is something you see running throughout all of Scripture. Go back in your mind to the Garden of Eden. We sin. Man sin. After man sinned, did man go running to God on his knees and say, please God, please God, I did wrong. I can't believe I broke your command. Will you just have mercy on me? Is that what man did? No, man sinned, man hid, God pursued, God provided. Not only judgment, but a way of deliverance. This is the great message of the gospel. It centers on God. God saves sinners. God is the hero of the gospel. You go back in your minds to Ephesians chapter 1. You'll see this on an even bigger scale, Ephesians 1. And again, I want you just to hear who does the acting in these verses. Sometimes people wonder, why are these guys so excited about the gospel? Why are they so excited about the good news? Well, I'm trying to help you see that this message is really unique. You go to every other religious place and they tell you, do this, do that, do this, do that. Maybe God will be happy with you. Maybe you can somehow manipulate God into giving you peace. We've got a much better news report than that. We, we get to gather together as God's people and focus on God and what God has done to provide the peace that we cannot earn. Ephesians chapter 1, verse 3. Blessed, Paul says, he's excited. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. This is a man on his knees worshiping God. Why? Listen to it. Verse 3. Who has blessed us in Christ with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places, even as he chose us in him before the foundation of the world, that we should be holy and blameless before him. In love he predestined us for adoption as sons through Jesus Christ, according to the purpose of his will, to the praise of his glorious grace, with which he has blessed us in the beloved. And we can keep going and going, but listen to this. You see, he blessed us, he chose us, he predestined us, he freely bestowed his grace on us. This is God, and what I'm trying to say is that the gospel, the good news, when you hear this news report, you and what you have done, you're not the headline. 
It's not man that saves himself. This is a news report about what God did. We're not the news. God is. The gospel is one-sided news of what God has done and what God will do. Sometimes when you watch those old movies, uh, you'll, you'll see a person selling a newspaper on the side of the street, and usually it's a, a boy, and he's crying out, Hear ye, hear ye. And he's announcing the news. And that's basically what we're doing when we proclaim the gospel. Hear ye, hear ye. We're standing on the road on the road, or in a flat or having a conversation on a taxi. And we're saying, hear ye, hear ye. We're not telling people when we tell them the gospel about how to be a good person. We're not telling them how to get their finances in order. We're not sharing with them a great self-help program. We're announcing a headline about what God and God alone has done. How God saves sinners. Now, obviously, there is a response you need to have to the news, but that response is not the news. There's uh, maybe you can imagine there's an earthquake that takes place in an ocean somewhere, and someone has to go through the streets of Durban, and the earthquake was out there in the ocean, and so there's a tsunami coming to Durban, and you can imagine this news. The tsunami is coming. Someone runs through the town proclaiming the news. Now, people need to have a response to that news, right? It would be crazy to go around saying, hey, the tsunami is coming, and somebody says, hmm, that's interesting, fascinating, philosophy. No, that's not philosophy. That's a news event, and you need to respond to it. You need to get out of there. Go to the hills. But you going to the hills is not the news event. That is your response to the news event. So with the gospel, we're proclaiming bigger news than a tsunami. We're saying, and we'll talk about this later, that the creator of the universe has become man. This is the most significant news in the world. We're saying the creator of the universe chose to humble himself and take on a body and walk around in human form to obey his own law perfectly and to die as a substitute for sinners on the cross and then rise again, ascend into heaven, and he's coming again to win and reverse the curse, judge his enemies and establish his kingdom. This is news, and, and your response to that news should be, whoa, what's going on? How should I, what should I do? How should I be part of his kingdom? How can I get right with this? This king. There needs to be a response to that news, but, but that response is not the good news. The good news is about a God who saved sinners, a God who became man to do for us what we could not do for us, for ourselves. And I want you to enjoy that today. God's the hero of the gospel, and that's the best news that you could ever possibly enjoy.